Terry has been at NOAA for 20 years, background in magnetospheric physics. Um, he's the director of the International Space Environment Services, co chairs the World Meteorological Organization's Inner Program coordination team on space weather and has the admirable task today of discussing transitions of taking research into real world applications. He's put a lot of thought into this talk and it's been fun to work with him on it. He's going to be talking about the space weather mission. Yeah, th 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 thank you very much. It's, it's certainly a pleasure uh, to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to be part of this uh, anniversary celebration. That's pretty loud, isn't it? I Okay, so I'll put it low here. Yeah, okay, maybe it's coming out of both. Is that better? Yeah, okay, that's good. Right. Uh, I guess when you look at an anniversary celebration, uh, everybody thinks of uh, history. So there's a fair amount of history in my talk that I'm, I'm seeing is overlapping uh, with the history in other people's talks. So please bear with me. And I, I, my title here, Space Weather Mission, uh, I'm not talking about a uh, specific satellite mission, but rather as space, space weather as an activity, uh, something that nationally and internationally uh, we have to uh, coordinate in order to accomplish. Uh, over time, uh, our connection to space has evolved through changes in scientific knowledge and in technology development. Our science has, ad has advanced. That's led to technology development, which has given us more science advances. And with the recent expansion of our technology infrastructure, our security uh, and, and economic infrastructure, we now see that we have a vulnerability uh, to space and, and to space weather that exceeds our ability to predict space weather and to understand it. And that leaves us with what I believe is a, a, a new imperative where we now have to focus our effort uh, also on expanding our scientific knowledge, but in addition, applying that knowledge to protecting our technology. Now, for space weather, we often think about it as being something relatively modern and associated with our technology, but in fact, uh, the space has been affecting society for thousands of years. Uh, back as far as 2,000, uh, 4,000 years, the aurora uh, have been as observed. The aurora borealis have been associated with the births of emperors, the death of emperors, uh, clearly very, very strongly connected uh, to people's lives. Eclipses have also been diligently recorded. These two gentlemen, Ho and He, uh, the ancient Chinese astronomers that were executed because they were drunk and they failed to uh, alert the community of an eclipse uh, which did not allow the community members to mitigate the impacts of the uh, alleged dragon that was coming and uh, de devouring the sun. Uh, also, sunspot records uh, have been accumulated since uh, roughly 165 BC and represent one of the longest records uh, of, of observational phenomena that we have today. Uh, the technology side, uh, roughly a thousand years later, was uh, become well known that the compass uh, was uh, valuable for improving navigation. Then in the year 1600, Gilbert, uh, using a Torella instrument, uh, made the discovery that the Earth is itself a magnet. And these two observations gave us the foundation for our ability to, to measure and scientifically understand uh, the impacts on technologies on the ground. Uh, just nine years later, Galileo invented the first telescope, which allowed us to study the sun and to bracket the solar side versus the geomagnetic side of the space environment and the solar terrestrial disturbances. Uh, with the telescope, the scientists were able to study the uh, evolution of, of, of active regions, detect the, the rotation of the sun, uh, and, and also then over time, the, uh, the solar cycle, the 11-year uh, the cycle that we've heard so much uh, about here today. And then the, the one equation that I'll show, our scientific knowledge also enhanced uh, because of the discovery of physical laws. Uh, this one uh, equation is the one that, that, that I feel is, is the most important. It shows us how the, the uh, changes in the magnetic field induce changes in the electric field. 
And this, the magic of Faraday's law tells us how the energy that's flowing in the solar wind with its convecting magnetic field, how the energy and the currents that are flowing overhead couple into our power grids and our technologies on the ground. Then with the uh, development further of technology, we, technologies, we had the first commercial telegraph system in 1839. Uh, some years later, in 1858, the first transatlantic cable was laid. Uh, and by this time now, there are about 200,000 kilometers uh, of telegraph wires on the ground in unprecedented ability to communicate. And just one year later, in 1859, is the event that we've heard so much about, where Richard Carrington was studying the evolution of this large solar flare and saw the first uh, of, of this active region and saw the bright solar flare that resulted. Uh, then uh, roughly 17 hours later was the largest geomagnetic storm on record. And what this did was give stark indication that these technologies that we were developing were now strongly connected to the activities in space, although that connection was not well understood. Uh, there were fires started. Uh, there were shocks that, 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 that people received. Uh, but most importantly, it, it, it gave this indication of this uh, very important connection between our technology on the ground and, and the space environment. Then the international activities advanced, uh, and collectively nations uh, d deployed magnetometers throughout the Arctic region. For the most part, the initial analysis of those data was done individually by countries looking at their own national assets. And one of the, one of the uh, major advances that Christian Birkeland made from Norway was to coordinate the observations from that collective set uh, and, and from that come up with one of the first uh, large scale uh, synthesis of the, uh, the, the, the polar magnetic field disturbances. He postulated that there is this strong ionospheric current, and importantly, that this current um, flows into and out of the magnetic field line enters into space. But one of the uh, most important puzzles that resulted from this was knowing just how and where those, uh, those electrical currents connect into space and what the, the source of that energy was. Then for, for the, uh, the interest of international collaboration continued. And as we've heard, heard from uh, Tom Berger's presentation in December 1st of, 2000, or of, of 1928, the uh, first uh, space weather uh, broadcasts were made uh, from the Eiffel Tower giving information about the terrestrial uh, magnetic field variability as also, uh, also about the, the, the sunspots and solar activity. And one of the large motivations for this was to coordinate the information that was being monitored there to the other scientists to get a better picture, a more coordinated effort to, under, to monitor and to understand the, the dynamics uh, of the space environment. Uh, but it really was, the, the, I think, the, the, as we've heard some about yesterday, the, the most important advances in our understanding of the space environment came with the international geophysical year, which is uh, believed by many to be one of the greatest collective uh, scientific achievements uh, in, in history. Uh, what this did was first, uh, it, it marked the beginning of the uh, human space age. It brought together tens of thousands of scientists from 67 nations. Uh, and, 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 it's, and still to today, I think the, the model that we use for doing science was put in place by this effort. We collect measurements from all over the world. We put them into world data centers. And we, we allow any nation or any nation around the world is encouraged to access those data and to try and collectively understand how the Sun-Earth system works. One of the most important advances of technology that occurred at this time uh, was the rocket. And with that, uh, the ability to uh, discover the, the, the radiation belts. Uh, this 
gave us enhanced scientific understanding, but it also opened up a new area of vulnerability that we hadn't been aware of before. I also wasn't aware until uh, Congressman Perlmutter's talk about how this provided us an important shield against some of the uh, aliens. Uh, but, but that's, I, I forget the name of that, that alien race. Uh, and, and, and with our ability to go into space, this puzzle that Birkeland had established uh, was resolved. Jim Dungy in 1961 drew this uh, seemingly simple diagram showing uh, th the discovery uh, of magnetic reconnection and how the Earth's magnetic field becomes interconnected with interplanetary space. And that is, in fact, how those electrical currents that Christian Birkeland described connect into interplanet interplanetary space and to the solar atmosphere uh, that, that we are a part of. So with the research, with the advances, the inter International Geophysical Year, the international collaboration, we've come to this understanding today of the sun, its dynamics, solar flares, coronal mass ejections, magnetic reconnection, the aurora, bo aurora borealis, how this sun-earth system operates. Uh, and, and with this scientific understanding, technology has continued to develop. Of course, we now have, with uh, 1969, uh, human activity in space, men on the moon. Uh, and in 1972, uh, the vulnerability to space was once again shown. Uh, there, in April of 1972, Apollo 16 was a successful mission. Uh, December 1972 was uh, Apollo 17. And then in sandwiched in between those two, in August of 1972, uh, was this 1972 solar proton event where luckily there were no astronauts on the moon at that time, but it's estimated that this solar proton event could have caused acute radiation sickness without uh, shielding or uh, some medical countermeasures. This event is, uh, as you can see here from the sizes of these many events estimated, the ones on the, on the left from uh, tree ring uh, records and other means, this is not an unusually large uh, it, it is large, but, but there are certainly many uh, uh, others comparable to it. Uh, then continuing on with the advances of, of our technologies, uh, in the late 90s with the end of the Cold War and the opening up of the airspace over Russia uh, and China, that allowed the possibility of polar routes, which took an increasing number of aircraft at the high latitudes and with the high latitude aircraft travelers also the proximity then to the solar proton access caused by those magnetic field lines that ex extend out into interplanetary space. This is a, an alert that was issued in 2003 during the Halloween storm from the Federal Aviation Administration of the radiation dam hazards that potentially can happen at high latitudes during these solar proton events to high altitude flights. And then the, with the uh, advent of, with the uh, increased um, congestion of air traffic and with the possibilities now of, uh, of uh, satellite-based navigation from our GPS system, our technologies are, are advancing in a number of uh, complex and interconnected ways. Uh, the, the, GNSS or GPS signals are directly received by the, the aircraft, but at the same time, we understand now, uh, we understand that there is this layer of the ionosphere that all of the GPS satellites need to tra transverse through in order to get to us here on the ground and, and on aircraft. And of course, uh, this layer uh, of the ionosphere can be severely disrupted by space weather. So what, they, what happens as a result, or in, a, in an attempt to mitigate that, the uh, satellite measurements are also received by a network of ground stations, which then measure the, this, the uh, disruption of the accuracy of that signal. That information uh, is then relayed to a geostationary satellite, which considerably farther out than the GNSS satellites, and then that information 
gets relayed uh, is available to the aircraft to, to correct uh, for uh, the, the, uh, the disturbances uh, caused in the ionosphere. So what this is giving us is an interconnection of our technologies here where we're relying on the satellite-based navigation. We're trying to mitigate the impacts of the ionosphere by using a ground network connected to a, a, another satellite network, uh, increasing uh, potentially our, our vulnerabilities to these disturbances in the space environment. Of course, with the uh, environment filling with satellites, uh, there are satellite uh, disruptions are a, a common occurrence uh, due, to, due, due to space weather. Uh, and one particular uh, example here uh, it, it, that was that happened recently uh, is the, uh, the the Galaxy 15 satellite, uh, which, due to space weather, uh, was uh, suffered an anomaly where it was unable, where the ground station was able, unable to to contact or or to communicate with it, but it continued to broadcast, uh, and it broadcast as it drifted roughly 45 degrees uh, through geostationary orbit across one of the most populated regions uh, of the geostationary environment. And, and as it went along, its broad broadcasts were, were uh, clobbering the uh, broadcasts of, of, of the other satellites along its path. Uh, and, and then uh, it just so happens, it, to illustrate this interconnectedness of our technologies, that that Galaxy 15 satellite was is precisely uh, the, the satellite that is used as the link to, to uh, connect this mitigation system, the, the, the wide area augmentation system for the, the GPS satellites. Uh, of course, the, the electric power impacts also are substantial. This one storm in October of 2003, the, uh, there was a power outage in, in Sweden, and with the same storm, uh, transformer damage in South Africa, uh, as well as uh, mitigating activities need to be taken in the U.S. And, and what this illustrates is how even though the space weather impacts are global in nature, the, 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 the uh, specific impacts can vary considerably uh, regionally, different locations uh, around the globe. Uh, the, the, cons the potential consequences of geomagnetic storms uh, have been estimated through a number of studies. A couple of recent studies here, one that, that uh, focused, uh, focused on the impacts uh, over Europe, uh, another concentrating on North America, and a number of these studies, uh, roughly the, the, uh, the impact that, that they're estimating is on the order of a a, a few trillion dollars. Of course, uh, there's a lot of controversy on that, but nonetheless, uh, the, the, the consequences can be quite large. Uh, countries around the world are, are recognizing this risk within the United Kingdom. Uh, space weather is part of that, the National Risk Register in the U.S. Space weather is recognized as a grand challenge uh, disaster for disaster reduction. Uh, and as we'll hear, later on this afternoon in Bill Murtha's presentation. Uh, it's one where there is a substantial uh, national effort uh, that is being organized to mitigate it. Uh, so given this, uh, what is the, the, the situation with uh, customers and, and the available space weather information that we have today? Uh, if we look back over this most recent solar cycle at the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center uh, in 2005, we put in place a subscription service to try to improve the ability of specific customers receiving just the information they need for the particular space weather hazard that they encounter. Uh, and this, the blue part of this chart here shows how the customers, number of customers has grown over the years. Even during solar minimum, there was a steady increase and, then, and that increase then uh, grew substantially as solar activity rose, even though the, the uh, level of this past solar maximum has not been uh, particularly high. Uh, all of the uh, major 
industry areas that I've mentioned so far and that we've heard about are customers of this subscription service. So although uh, it, it appears as though there is a lot of valuable information that is being used, it's still the case that the uh, majority of what it is that industry wants, we are not yet able to provide today. For example, what, what the customers really would like to know is, will there be a solar flare tomorrow? Will there be a coronal mass ejection tomorrow? And if there is one, will, when will it arrive? When it arrives, uh, uh, when will the geomagnetic activity be? How long will it last? What can I expect the errors in my uh, navigation accuracy to be? Uh, these are the kinds, this is the kind of information that we would like to be able to provide and, and that we need to provide because the demand for these services is here today, but we are unable to provide this kind of information. So if we look back at what happened with, uh, compare where we are today with the situation around the International Geophysical Year, um, a number of parallels, but, but, but changes that need to be made. In the IGY, it was imperative to monitor as much as possible on the ground and in space in order to improve our understanding of the space environment. Now what we need is a similar comprehensive ground-based and space-based observing infrastructure, but one that's focused on these operational problems that we have to deliver answers to today. And whereas our understanding of the space environment, how the Sun-Earth system works, has improved considerably, we need to turn that into useful information now so that we can provide the targeted services that people need. And just like previously, when the information need to be, needed to be shared around the world globally so that we could have a collective scientific understanding, now we need to be able to deliver a consistent and accurate global mes message of the specific impacts that, that, that could be faced by the technologies. For example, when an airplane leaves the United States and heads to Brazil, we need to be able to tell them how the ionospheric conditions could be impacting their navigation here as well as when they're landing in the, in the airport uh, in Brazil. Right now we have networks, uh, just a, a, an example of the kinds of observations that we have today, but that, are, that still are not adequate for what we need. As an example of one project, uh, the United Nations International Space Weather Initiative deployed roughly 600 instruments around the ground that are operating, although almost none of these today are available in real time to feed into our service capabilities. Uh, and, and on the right, uh, more than 25 space agencies are contributing satellites and observations throughout uh, the magnetosphere, ionosphere, and solar wind. Uh, but as you can see from the duration of these bars here, the research satellites all have limited duration, and for the most part, their measurements are directed at what is needed for a particular science question, not necessarily uh, useful uh, or directly applicable for the kinds of services that we need to deliver today. And so one of the, uh, uh, one of the activities that's happening internationally, the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space uh, and their, ex their space weather expert group in the long-term sustainability of outer space effort uh, has put forward these recommendations uh, that we need to promote the intercalibration and the dissemination of these observations, these space weather observations, in a way that's more directly useful for our services. And we need to work on the long-term continuity of the key observations that we need for our services, such as the L1 mission, the coronagraph, the set of, of, of measurements that will enable the kinds of services that we need today. Uh, and then I, I believe there needs to be uh, somewhat of a, a, a paradigm shift in, in our thinking of the target of our activities in the IGY, uh, as described here in this uh, report of the technical plan panel on the Earth Satellite Program, uh, it was recognized that this research effort uh, could participate, uh, could be useful, uh, could have a practical uh, application, but it was understood that the basic goal 
of this effort really need to be, needed to be exploration and the quest for knowledge. And, and, and now I believe we need a shift uh, to, to devoting our effort towards the development of specific targeted services building on this research effort. And this has started uh, the most recent solar and space physics decadal survey that was released a couple of years ago had a number of recommendations. Uh, if you scroll down to the very bottom of the list, the last recommendation, it does mention here that there is the need to develop and maintain a distinct program for developing improved space weather specification and forecasting. So it is recognized uh, that, that, that this is it is a, a necessary effort, uh, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a paradigm shift in, in how, how we focus our activities. Uh, similarly, uh, a space weather roadmap uh, was recently developed internationally by the Committee on Space Research, uh, co-sponsored co by COSPAR and the International Living with a Star uh, program. Uh, they recognized that over the recent years, there's been quite a significant growth uh, in interest in publications and websites on space weather. Uh, and they also came up with the, the, the highest priority uh, research recommendation was to improve space weather forecasts through the innovative incorporation of data in, in our uh, numerical models. Uh, and to, to illustrate that, with, with, with numerical weather prediction, uh, they use enormous volume of data with each prediction uh, in order to make the most accurate weather forecast possible. We have a whole host of data on the ground, data in interplanetary space and throughout the magnetosphere. And to date, with our models uh, of interplanetary space of the uh, solar wind and coronal mass ejections. So far, uh, we, there are no data that we assimilate into these models in a data assimilation capability. Similarly, with our magnetosphere models, uh, none of the ground-based magnetic field measurements or our space-based measure measurements are used in a data assimilation capability in these models. Uh, with, the, with the ionosphere, of course, we're starting to do data assimilation, and those forecasts are improving. But this is an, an, an area where the COSPAR uh, space weather uh, roadmap effort recognized that we can really pay dividends uh, in, the, in the increases of our capability by more effectively using the data that we have today in the models that we have today. Uh, and, and my dream, uh, I'll put this out here as, as, as my, my prediction, my hope, we're here celebrating the, the 75th uh, anniversary. Uh, I hope that the 80th anniversary uh, uh, is done highlighting now advances in Sun Earth data assimilation system. Uh, I, I'm hoping that HAO will take this on because I think HAO is the institution that is best positioned in the nation to accomplish this task of taking the models we have today and the data we have today and moving them forward in a data assimilation system. Uh, and then the last point is the communication of this, this information. In 1928, we had the single broadcast to try and get scientists all together and informed of the changes. Uh, by 1982, we had uh, a, a larger number of, of regional warning centers for space weather information. Today, there are 17 regional warning centers of the International Space Environment Service. The World Meteorological Organization also is moving forward uh, in, in collectively advancing space weather, working to uh, sustain our observing capabilities, improve the delivery of information, and in particular to support key application areas. And one of the most ap important application areas we have uh, to date that's, that's emerging is aviation with the International Civil, a Civil Aviation Organization. Uh, of, of course, airlines, uh, congestion is increasing, drones are proliferating. This all needs to be coordinated through space-based navigation systems. There will be commercial space transport in the future. And so in response to that, this UN level organization is in the process of developing service requirements, uh, developing capabilities uh, for 
distributing and coordinating the regional information needed to provide the services uh, to this activity. So in summary, uh, we have come to the point uh, in our interplay between advances in scientific knowledge and, technolo and technology development to where I believe our, our technology here far exceeds our ability to address it with our space weather knowledge and forecasts. Uh, and that gives us uh, the new imperative today to apply this knowledge that we have uh, to the technology through sustained operational uh, observations, targeted research for our services, and then globally coordinating that to, to address the needs today as well as in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. And if anyone can talk as quickly as Terry just did for his last talk, they can ask one quick question. So Terry, there's a long history of this uh, uh, connection with a practitioner community, uh, customers for these, this kind of information, right? And so uh, can you comment at another level of detail about how you go about learning their needs and the format in which they need this information delivered. I mean, this is an issue in, in climate uh, considerations now, and, and space weather has been doing this for a longer bit of time, and I wonder if there's any experience there that would be of value. Yeah, it, it's a good question. There's a lot of experience there, <laughs> and I, I think, to me, one of the most important points is that we know enough today about what the users need to move forward in many key areas. And the second point is that it needs to be a continuous iteration because technology changes, the vulnerabilities change, our capabilities change. Those two need to go hand in hand, but, but there's no reason why we should say that any effort at providing targeted services should wait until we have a better understanding of the specific needs because we know perfectly well what enough of those needs are, the most important ones, to move forward right away. That's right. Yep. Great. Oh, thanks again, Terry. Yep. Thank you.